Thanks for joining us. Um, Sunshine Brosey and I are gonna talk about obstacles to learning increase for college students in the COVID era. So we were looking at uh, different challenges that students might face and how they've changed due to COVID. So I'm Becky Williams. I am a professor of biology here at Utah State and my co-presenter. Hi, I'm Sunshine Brosey, and I'm in the Wildland Resources Department at Utah State. And I'm in the Price Statewide Campus, and Becky's in Uinta Basin Statewide Campus. Um, I like to begin like we begin our syllabi and our classes and our learning management systems on our Canvas page by incorporating an Indigenous land acknowledgement. And we also recognize that it's not just enough to um, state that we're existing on stolen lands, but think about what actions we can have as campuses and with our students for repatriation. Um, and then uh, our, basically I wanna talk a little bit about these obstacles. I think a lot of times people say, you know, this pandemic error, everyone's in this together. And we can think about common obstacles that our students faced, um, like noisy roommates or um, other issues, not having privacy to study. And then we can also think about additional stresses and challenges, like death of a loved one, maybe due to COVID or for other reasons, um, increased anxiety and depression, social isolation. Um, and then, these are just some of the quotes that our students brought up as some of the obstacles they were facing. I also wanted to note that these interviews were approved through the Inter um, Institutional Review Board IRB protocol, and that this is students that were enrolled in various ecology courses in the fall of 2020 and spring of 2021. So our questions that we had is that both Becky and I realized that we have students that are at statewide campuses that may have additional obstacles, um, including geographic isolation, which may cause technology issues. We have many students that are place bound because they're either taking care of a child or they're married or they're taking care of an elderly um, adult. And so those might add additional stresses due to COVID. And we have some non-traditional students. So the obstacles we were focused on learning about were technology, and this included accessibility, reliability, and comfort level. Um, the learning environment, if they had a safe private area to learn and their caregiving responsibilities, and then economics such as employment, housing, and food security. So um, thinking about these three levels of obstacles, we developed a couple methods to look at how the students were being impacted. So we went through the IRB process and we developed um, learning gains. These were pre and post tests that the students took to see, to measure how much they got out of the course, if they understood some core, core concepts when they left the course. And those were based on an external instrument. Um, so these Eco Evo maps, and then we had an obstacles survey where we asked them about their challenges and how those challenges had increased or decreased or changed since the COVID era. And we incorporated the USDA's food security questionnaire. So here's an example of our Qualtrics essay. So we had, um, it was an anonymous survey. So we had a unique identifier. And then we asked them a couple of questions like the internet in my house is very reliable. I can easily watch the videos on the internet in my house. A couple of other things. Um, or I use a smartphone or tablet to access course content, which can make viewing the course content more difficult. So we asked them what their current situation was, if there was this, if this occurred often, sometimes or never, and then the changes since the pandemic, if it's gotten worse, better, or if it's similar. So that's how we structured our surveys. And so we asked them um, these questions surrounding technology, surrounding their learning environment and economics. So um, a lot of these were, they worry about eviction, um, 
They have to work more hours, questions about food. Um, so of our students, we had 57% uh, of our respondents were female, 43% male. Um, and you can see that we had um, the majority, uh, about a quarter of the students identified as non-white. Um, and then we had them uh, with various levels of transportation. So we had a couple students that lived um, over three hours away from campus, uh, one hour, between an hour and two hours away. So we asked them those sorts of questions, lots of demographic questions. So um, what we discovered in our results that a large proportion of students are experiencing challenges along these lines within these um, three large areas. So you can see that um, students reported um, having these challenges often or sometimes. So often in the red, sometimes in the orange. Um, and so they're having, um, we're having half of our students, for example, experiencing technology problems at some point during the semester, and that's going to impact their learning. Um, and then we see that most of the, or a large proportion of respondents also reported that these challenges have gotten worse since COVID. So um, they're uh, getting uh, a lot more challenges um, than they had before, partly because uh, we assume uh, the distance format. So we also surveyed the students for potential solutions that they think might help them, including whether they would like more asynchronous material, um, if they would like us to facilitate study groups, um, if they would like to create peer assistance groups, um, if they needed additional study guidance, um, if they would like additional office hours to talk to instructors directly, if they would like more flexible assignment deadlines or additional personal time meeting with the instructors built into the class. Um, and what we see uh, that many of the students reported a high priority of having more asynchronous material. Um, as well as more flexible assignment deadlines. And so they identified those resources or something that they would really appreciate um, having to help them surmount these challenges. And then we also looked at our pre-test, post-test to um, assess learning gains in the class. Um, and so this is just an example of one of the questions on our pre and post test. And you can see that the correct answer in purple in the pretest, about 38% of the students uh, answered that correctly. And that increased to almost 75% of our students. So we were actually able to take the, um, the amount of learning gains uh, calculated from these pre post tests. And then we could look at how those learning gains might have been affected by the challenges the students were facing. Um, so what we see here is the number of learning gains on the left versus the number of obstacles. Um, so students reported uh, a total number of obstacles faced from zero to 14. Um, and learning gains is on the y-axis there. And um, there is no relationship between these variables. We just did kind of a quick and dirty look at our students that are facing more challenges, uh, having lower learning gains. And what we see is that, um, not unsurprisingly, that the answer is more complicated than that. We also see a large variety of, um, or a large spread in learning gains um, versus students that are the number of obstacles that students uh, report facing often. And so it's um, not just a matter of the number of learning gains, but we are excited to look at um, 
uh, do more sophisticated analyses to suss out what um, challenges might actually be influencing learning gains um, versus what are what challenges or obstacles are less influential on learning gains. So that's our next step is to look at um, more um, closely and in depth in what might be uh, impacting learning gains. So to do this, we can tease out um, different different uh, types of challenges. We haven't incorporated um, the demographics yet. Um, and then of course we wanna look at in intersectionality, whether a particular combination of challenges um, such as feeling like a member of a stereotyped group, um, sex or race um, might have more of an effect when all all of those things are experienced at the same time. Um, so, um, Sunshine, do you, would you like to take it away? Yeah, and I guess I, another thing that I would think is an important next step is that um, there's a lot of work that goes into these kind of scholarship of teaching and learning activities, including how to set up your IRB, how to ask the right questions, um, a lot of basics of ethnography studies. And I think that one of the things that Becky and I would like to do is make that easier for this, for faculty members that come um, in the future that want to figure out how to get these pre and post test learning gains, but also want to figure out how to ask the correct questions to figure out how to um, address our student needs and have the data behind addressing that more easily accessible. Just um, uh, one of the challenges we came up, we noticed was in the unique identifier for the students, a lot of times they would forget what they wrote at the beginning to the end. So we have to come up with a better question that they can remember what that is. It reminded me of when you um, have to answer questions about the name of the street you grew up on. <laughs> Sometimes you might put different things down. So uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, and then I think an, another thing that we can think about is our facility support. So we had um, some students that said they accessed their course on their cell phones and they might've had um, less learning gains. So how do we support those students, especially in courses like ours, where we use things like Excel and stimulations and lots of things that require a larger screen. And then um, is there a way that we can use a pre-course survey to kind of predict which interventions might work best for our students? It was, it was great to see our students say they wanted flexibility in the deadlines. We kind of already assumed that that would happen, but that information should be incorporated at the very beginning of the course instead of at the end going, oh yeah, let's make our courses have flexible deadlines right before the final, right? Um, so I think we can think about uh, our community support, our instructor support, and then also our facility. So what are the things that we need to have on campus, um, like study zones or areas with fast Wi-Fi or other things that we can provide as a campus to help support these students? Um, so one of the things that kind of struck me when I was looking over this data is um, a response from a student that said they didn't feel safe at home. And it, it makes you kind of think about who your students are. And so I, I really um, enjoyed having the opportunity to look at the student data and kind of get to know the students better. And I think it was good for them even to voice the things that they were probably feeling that they might not have put down. Um, otherwise. So I think that's important. Um, some solutions that we want that the students want is that instructional support. They don't care about our office hours, but they definitely want us to have flexibility in our deadlines. Um, and we can think about what we what specific support our students need and how we can address those needs. Um, and this is a picture of Becky and I. We're socially distancing. <laughs> And you can find us, our um, information is listed here below, our emails. We'd appreciate any suggestions or any comments, feel free to email us. If you want um, to get involved or if you want to do um, research and want to see a copy of our IRB or need any 
um, support, we'd be happy to support you as well. And we have a couple of references. So thanks so much, guys. Yes, thank you. Please do contact us with questions. We'd love to continue the conversation.